Aloha, welcome to Talk Story with John Waihege. Today we have a special guest. I'm even, I, I'm, I'm sitting here just excited. I, I never thought we'd ever have a real United States Senator uh, with us this morning. And we have Brian Schatz. And this is the day before the big election, Senator. And what I, say, folks, this is the story. He and I share a passion for uh, things political. So we, we, we like to talk about it, not only about policy, which he's very good at, but at uh, how elections may go and how elections may turn out. So Senator, I am gonna take advantage of your presence and, uh, this morning and um, talk a little bit about uh, tomorrow. Well, this is going to be fun for me because I, I'm sort of an amateur pundit data guy. And <laughs> normally when I talk about uh, elections and politics, I try to stay on the policy side. But, I mean, what, what is on everybody's mind is, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, first of all, <laughs> uh, I, want to, I, I totally believe that uh, you're going to win the election tomorrow, okay? Well, I feel uh, somewhat comfortable. So, um, <laughs> Uh, so now we can talk about other people. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> well, first of all, obviously, on the, uh, on the national scene, we got this uh, election going on between uh, Trump and, and uh, Secretary Clinton. And what's your prognostication? Well, I feel more comfortable now than I did um, probably uh, even a couple of days ago. I think <laughs> Director Comey's sort of inexplicable... Uh, original letter 10 days ago or so, followed by a Sunday letter, you know, two days prior to the election, which essentially said, never mind. Um, an absolute um, uh, 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 departure from normal FBI. Yeah, it, it seems like the whole thing uh, just got tangled up. In, in, uh, it's either, it was either a really bad mistake or a very uh, diabolical. Right. It was either intentional or not, but either right. way it was inexcusable. But I do think that there were, look, I don't think most people are concerned about your email protocol, but I think you're talking about a game of inches, right? right. And so it doesn't have to matter to most people in order to impact the election. And what we saw uh, w after the Comey letter hit was that Hillary probably lost a point or two and our Senate candidates lost a point or two. And just to give you a sense for how much that mattered, um, there are seven or eight Senate races that are all within the margin. See, that's, that's really why I wanted to go with this. Uh, uh, y you know, the, what, 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 what do you think was the downside impact of, uh, of all of that? Well, we think we're recovering, um, but I'll just kind of run down the Senate uh, Yeah, races. I'd love to. So, so we have uh, probably eight pickup opportunities. Um, a couple of them are pretty nearly in the bag. The first on the list, I think Hawaii people will be happy to know, is likely to be Tammy Duckworth uh, from Hawaii. Cool. Yeah, that would be great. She's, um, she's in a very comfortable position. She's in a, you know, d a sort of a deep blue uh, state, so I think she's going to be uh, the new senator, uh, junior senator from Illinois. Um, Russ Feingold is returning uh, to politics and probably going to win in Wisconsin, although that's a little bit tighter. Um, then there's a kind of batch of races where we are ahead but not by a lot so what about uh, Ka Catherine and, uh, oh Catherine Cortez Masto is doing yes. really well and the really um, to me the gratifying exciting thing that happened uh, over the last four or five days is that it looks like Latino turnout uh, is more surging. oh it's 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 um it's like nothing anybody could have predicted well I suppose if somebody starts their campaign by insulting a whole uh, community of people, it's not surprising that they would rise up and express themselves uh, through the process. But I mean, I was watching every blow by blow on my phone on Friday night. Um, in there's a, a sort of Mexican grocery store called Cardenas um, in Clark County uh, in the Las Vegas area, and they're the, they're uh, as long as you're in line state. So in other words, they won't close the. Uh, the polling place until everyone who is in line gets a chance to vote. So they were going to close at six. Then right. they were going to then they postponed it to ten, and then they postponed it to midnight just to allow people to vote. There is a nearly doubling of Latino uh, uh, voting in both Florida, Nevada, 
Colorado. Um, and Catherine Virginia. is Catherine is from Nevada. She's uh, yeah, that's right. And and the the she will be the first um, uh, Latina in the United States Senate. So that's Whoa, really exciting. Fantastic. You know, and, and and what's interesting about that particular state as well as Washington and Oregon is that there's so many people from Hawaii living in Nevada, Washington, and Oregon. So, uh, you know, is there what kind of impact you think the Hawaii voters might have on the race? You know, they're pretty decisively both uh, because, especially in Hawaii, uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign was actually calling into Nevada to try to identify people with a Hawaii affiliation. But the other group that has most decisively moved in the, into the D column nationally is Asian Americans. Okay. And um, uh, I think there is just a recognition that Donald Trump is dangerous uh, uh, for uh, people who have any relationship to immigrants, right? On right, a family right. level. And uh, remember that, you know, Asian American immigrants were not always decisively in the D column, right? Especially on the mainland. But what's happened is um, that they're starting to make an impact in a couple of key states in Virginia, um, interestingly in North Carolina as well. Certain parts of the South, there are um, growing immigrant Asian communities, and they're, they're all in for Hillary. So um, not only has the Latino community really sort of risen up, but the national Asian community um, is, is now strongly democratic. And it's not because all of these folks, a lot of these folks come from places where the government is actually communist, right? Right. So they're not, they don't show up inclined towards a view of government that is more expansive, right? Yeah. So, so <laughs> the Republicans should have a fighting shot at a Chinese immigrant, a Vietnamese immigrant, and all well, the rest of it. Well, you would think it. so. You would think so. But they're not articulating a small government tolerance, right? It's all intolerance. It's all fear. Uh, it's all an undermining of the legitimacy of your of your physical so, presence in the state. Do you think then, uh, and I'm assuming this, I'm getting this from uh, from your conversation, that if Hillary Clinton wins the presidency, there's a good chance that the Senate of the United States might uh, turn over to the Democrats? Yeah, I think we are in a very good position to get to about 50. Um, so if it's a 50-50 tie, then Tim Kaine actually breaks the tie right. uh, uh, to, to make sure that uh, Chuck Schumer is majority leader. But I think we still have a chance to get to 52-53. Now, let me tell you something. The, the Senate has this unique 60-person closure rule, right? Which right. means that debate cannot be turn, uh, cut off on the, on, unless you have 60 people voting to do that. Right. So that has always given people that are in opposition to, uh, uh, you know, what's ever being proposed, the, and it's sort of an, a, an advantage. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, the idea of cloture, right, is that it, in order to pass anything in the United States Senate, it, for the most part, you're going you're gonna to need 60 votes, and therefore you're going to need some bipartisanship. And that rule is sort of the foundation of the Senate in terms of forcing folks to work together. You cannot just pass something on a 51. But what, what do you do when you, in this current situation, where you have people who don't want to work just won't, too, right. who just won't do that? Well, it's really interesting because, um, because I've been doing a lot of thinking about that. Uh, I like the way the Senate is different from other legislative bodies, where if I have a good idea for a bill, <clears throat> before, um, before um, filing the bill, i got to find a Republican. I have okay. to find someone who likes my idea enough. And vice versa. <clears throat> and vice versa, and it, so it forces folks to work together. And so on that level, I like that because it, it distinguishes the U.S. Senate from every other place where this rule causes you to be totally ineffective if you're not willing to work with the other side of the aisle. And so it has caused me to develop relationships and, and improve legislation because i got to talk to conservatives. It's great. But your question is a different one. Right. Well, what if they just won't? Yeah, what if they just don't want to, and we have the same kind of stalemate? Well, so the, there's cloture for legislation, the 60-vote threshold for legislation, and then there's a 60-vote threshold for the um, for advice and consent to get judges, to get Supreme see, Court that's, justices. See, that's where this question's heading. As see, I see. think that um, all of this depends on goodwill and good faith. 
And so if there's goodwill and good faith on the legislative side and there still is some remaining goodwill and good faith, then I think we retain that 60 vote threshold. But if they come into a conversation, for instance, about uh, uh, President-elect, uh, knock on wood's uh, uh, ability to, uh, to nominate and confirm her own cabinet, or to even have a full complement of Supreme Court justices. Yeah, there's some conversation saying that pe some people don't care if we have a full, co which is, I mean, just outrageous, but in it's, my mind. It's right. totally outrageous, and at that point, I I'd be for lowering the threshold to 51, because, you know, it's one thing for us to set our own internal rules, and th that's sort of our prerogatives, because it's, it's the U.S. Senate, and we get to make our own rules, but to the extent that our rules prevent the other branches of government from even functioning. In other words, you can't have a cabinet or you can't have a Supreme Court because every Republican is so afraid of the Tea Party that they won't vote for anybody. Right. Then with the moment we get to 50, if, if those people follow through on their threats, then I think we have to change the rule and say, we're going to get Supreme Court justices, we we're going to get cabinet to positions. We've got to govern. Right. We have to govern. And, and you know, it's sort of interesting to me is that, okay, let's assume that something awful happens and we have a Trump presidency, mm. right? I, I, you know, it's, I, I've been thinking about the fact that uh, it, people uh, in, don't realize that in many instances, Trump's position doesn't necessarily coincide with his Republican uh, colleagues. For example, traditionally, traditionally, uh, Dem uh, Republicans have been in favor of free trade. In fact, all of the free trade agreements of the past really happened as a result of Democrats eventually agreeing mm -hmm. with, uh, with Republicans. So now we have a president who goes exactly opposite in, on that issue. There are other issues, a strong Russia policy. The Republicans have been always stood for strong anti-Russia. Now we have, uh, if Trump was to be elected, we would have a president who's soft on Russia, uh, saying it kindly. And, and so what do these people do? I mean, how does all of this work together? I have no idea. I, was, I, I had <laughs> such great difficulty in, in um, noticing, believing, uh, and, and certainly in predicting Trump's rise. I mean, I had, in my little pool, I had Jeb Bush as getting the nomination. Yeah, me second, too. Uh, and that's Walker. why we vote wrong. That's why we're talking <laughs> about it today. So, so I don't know. Um, but I think you're right that there is now a real rift in the Republican Party, and it's not at all clear how that would play out in a, in a legislative context. Well, some, of, some people I know have been suggesting that it doesn't matter who gets elected president, that there'll be some kind of impeach, impeachment movement. Uh, hopefully not, but there's been this suggestion. And I, I, I thought about it, and it, it seemed to me that if there was an impeachment movement against a president, Clinton or Hillary Clinton, that you wouldn't a sing, not a single Democrat would vote uh, for impeachment uh, in the House or, or the Senate. But if there was a, an impeachment movement for a President Trump, you might find Republicans who would prefer having Mike Pence as president and therefore be more willing to join the Democrats than otherwise. Do you, am I just like? crazy or am I, this a fantasy or is this well, a possibility? I, I think if you're, if you're imagining an impeachment scenario uh, on both sides, um, my own view is that one would be sort of a manufactured, sort of pre-adjudicated um, uh, outrage at the fact that Hillary Clinton's president. Right. If it were Trump, I can imagine a high crime or misdemeanor against the United Especially States government. Especially if you're if you <laughs> passing information over to Russia. Right, and so, so there are Republicans uh, in, the, in the Senate and the House who are patriots and worry, forget the policy side, right? Free trade or anti-TPP right, or, right. or whatever, tax policy, those are all important. Uh, uh, elements of what we do, but there is a foundation, right, which is um, the rule of law, which is respect for the Constitution, uh, which is respect for institutions, and believing that the alliance, especially in the international context, that the alliances that we've built over the last 50 to 80 years are worth retaining. Mm -hmm. And there, I think, really are Republicans, if Trump were to win, who would 
forget impeachment for the moment, who would push back as vigorously as they, they could against, against, against stuff that they basically disagree with. The problem is that even if Trump loses decisively tomorrow, he will have gotten 45% of the vote. Mm. And that is a non-trivial number of people to contend with. And then going into the midterms, um, that's, I think, who Republican members of Congress fear the most. Fear the most. So we are going to take a short break right now. We're going to come back, Senator, and we're going to start talking, putting the same kind of heavy analysis on the Hawaii races. All right. Okay, so we'll be right back. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on Think Tech Hawaii. Com. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. <laughs> Aloha. Welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe'e and our special guest, Senator Schatz. And, oh, we, you know, by the way, if you want to ask a question, uh, you can call our hotline, which is 415-871-2474. Or you can tweet us and uh, mix me all up. But anyway, we, we, the tweet is Think Tech Hawaii. H-I. And we have a tweet. And this is Bert Lum. How you doing, Bert? If you get a chance, please ask Senator Schatz about... The, you you got to do this, uh, Senator, because I, I don't even understand the language. So Bert's asking me about the open data bill that I've done actually with uh, with Senator Ben Sass who, to, to, to illustrate the point about, about the... Uh, the need for bipartisanship. Uh, ben Sass is uh, the fourth most conservative senator in the United States Senate. He's a young guy, and he and I did a bill, and it's it's actually pretty straightforward. It just requires that all government data that is collected that's not uh, uh, classified or otherwise protected, you know, under right. HIPAA or whatever right. it may be, be collected in a way that is um, interoperable and machine readable. And the reason that that matters is that you know, we're collecting all kinds of really important data sets that the public actually owns. But for the most part, the way you get that data is you have to go to a government building. Right, right? and file for it. Hold a file. Uh, or th at best, they'll send you a PDF. In this big data world with all kinds of apps that can make really interesting use of data, what we want is all of it to be in the same format so that people can get data sets about weather or real estate or transportation systems and start to do things on the private sector side smarter. So I'm really excited about this. And then the, the sort of conservative argument for this, which is why I got a good conservative to co-sponsor yeah, the bill. What is the conservative argument for that? He thinks that the more transparency this, th there is in terms of the, go the government collection of data, um, the more that waste, fraud, and inefficiency will be rooted out. And I said, well, I, have, I would have no yeah, objection to that. None of us would object That's to right. that, right? Except if we were the people being accused of, rape, of uh, you know, waste and rest of it. Yeah, so it's moving along, and we, we hope to get it passed. The, well, you never know. It's the Senate. It could so be you next got week. one supporter. You know, there's uh, Bert out there, and he thinks you're doing a great job. Right. I, 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 you know, I, I, I understand the concept. I understand the concept, and I'm all for it. I, I just don't understand what... How it mechanics. will work, that's yeah, all right. But then I don't need to. It's like my... Anyway, let's talk about Hawaii. We got some exciting races, and then we also got the fact that I think most of the state legislature will probably be all the incumbents coming back, right? I mean, I, I don't know. Is there any interesting... Yeah, I think there are, I think there are very few uh, interesting uh, state legislature races. Obviously, uh, Sam Sloan versus uh, Stanley Chang is an interesting yeah, one. Yeah, that's sort of a, you know, an interesting one because uh, Stanley's a young guy and uh, trying to make his mark again. 
and and uh, Sam, Sam is Sloan the only Sloan, uh, yeah. yeah, but he's the only Republican in the state Senate. Yeah, so I think there are a lot of people who are wrestling with the question of, well, do I vote for Stanley because I agree with him, or do I vote for Sam because I believe in the idea that there ought to be at least some opposition to the Democrats just to keep them honest. Right. And so um, it's a, it's, it'll be you interesting. You know, but one of the interesting uh, guests that I had here um, was uh, Bet Fukumoto. Oh, Chen. yeah who unfortunately is running against a, a real solid Democrat, but nevertheless, a, as a person in the, as a Republican, she, in my mind, personified what I believe the new Republicans in Hawaii ought to look like, progressive, Hawaii-oriented, and, and the rest. And yet she is under a lot of attack by her own party. So I don't know how much of that, you know, Brett, what do you call it? Brett Brock, Brett, that alt-right. Alt oh, yeah. Uh, situation is actually permeating in Hawaii. Well, I think it's, you know, it's not as bad as it is in other places, but I, I, I got to say, locally and nationally, the people who I feel really bad for in politics are thoughtful, patriotic Republicans who are trying to survive primaries, trying to keep a coalition together that is fraying internally, massively. I think they've sort of duct taped over it because they've been able to unite against the idea of a, a Clinton presidency and a liberal Supreme Court. So they sort of have papered over this just to kind of get across the finish line. But these divisions are real. Right. And there are, I think, a lot of uh, conservatives who feel that this kind of revolutionary, alt-right, Breitbart universe where, um, where analysis is, uh, is failing people, where there's very little in the way of real expertise, uh, respect for science, respect for institutions, um, you know, the kinds of, when I represented Makiki Tantalus and Manoa, there's a pretty significant conservative Republican community out there. And, but they're not, you know... They're not the alt-right. But they're thoughtful folks. Right, I mean, they've, right. they, 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 they study, they read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, they keep up on things, they just have a different view than well, I what, do. What's so interesting to me is that all this, all of a sudden, the, the uh, Republican Party is getting associated with being anti-immigration, and yet one of the great stalwarts of Asian immigration was Senator Fong from mm. Hawaii. Yeah. I mean, if you wanted a repu local Republican hero, uh, there he is. Pat Psyche was in right. favor of this sort of thing. But anyway, we, they, I hope that that uh, negative is, uh, uh, doesn't start creeping. That kind of negative uh, doesn't start creeping into our politics. Yeah. But we got the mayor's race. Yeah, so I think, um, I, I think Kirk Caldwell is going to be successful tomorrow. I'm obviously a supporter of Kirk, uh, as, as you are. And I think, you know, here's, here's my, now just on, on the pundit side, because I, I won't use this as a commercial for Kirk. But I think that, um, oh, go unless ahead. you let me, but, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, a little bit, you know, no, so, go ahead. So I think that, um, you know, in the end, um, that Charles didn't paint a picture of how he would actually govern. Yeah. That he was sort of, that his opening salvo, as it usually is, is relatively precise, mm. disciplined, effective. You know, um, he, he's very good at the critique, but there was no next paragraph, right? And there was right. no, um, I can't tell you how Charles would govern other than that he thinks he would do a better job and that he has a basic inclination towards smaller government. But I think where he failed, and I think there were a lot of Democrats and independents who were open to him um, leading the city and county, given that it's hard to lead a city. I mean, right, there are always right. challenges. And so I think any incumbent mayor running for re-election shows up with probably 40% of the public, you know, willing to vote for someone else. So you just <laughs> got to get that last 10%. But I think where Charles failed, frankly, is he just couldn't describe what he would actually do if he were in office other than that he would do better. Well, I, I noticed one thing. Um, first of all, you've got great television commercials, you know, and, and all of that. But as I listen to the radio and other places, you seem to be uh, talking more about electing Bob Lindsay oh. <laughs> to, uh, to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs than you are about getting votes for yourself. What, what, what's that all about? Well, I feel really strongly about Bob. Um, he has been an incredible leader at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. We've worked together on a, a number of things. But, you know, just, and you know this, uh, uh, Governor, 
that this is a time of incredible transition, right. um, not just for OHA as an institution, but for, for Native Hawaiians generally. And I think that there's going to be a range of opinions about how to move forward on self-determination. There's always a range of, of opinions about how to utilize OHA's um, uh, resources best. Um, natural resources questions come in. So there's lots of disagreement, and as there should be in any well, uh, there's big a, community. There's a lot of importance to these issues. Right. And, and anytime something's important, you're not going to just have people sitting around, you know, just melting into agreement. I right. Mean, there has to be some discussion. But, but where I think Bob has displayed the leadership that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs has, uh, needs, and also that the state of Hawaii needs, is um, its disposition, you know, its, its temperament. I mean, I saw a lot of stuff online saying, you know, I disagree with Bob about X, Y, and Z, but he's a good leader. And I think, especially in the Native Hawaiian community, um, which I, I think it's fair to say, you know, I'm not a member, but it, they value a diversity of opinions. They value Well, that's what process. I thought. That, uh, no, you are, though, a member of the uh, Indian Affairs Committee right. for the state, for the Senate. Yeah, and the Indian Affairs Committee is where, you know, all matters related to Native Hawaiians as they, as they intersect with the federal government uh, come through our committee. And OHA has been really good to work with. Uh, when, when the president, when we basically hit a brick wall on the so-called Akaka Bill, right? Um, I sat with you, I sat with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and there was an effort to come up with an alternative strategy that took into account the fact that we have Barack Obama in office right. and we're unlikely, even though Secretary Clinton is going to be great for Hawaiians, it's unlikely we'll ever get anyone who's better on Hawaiian mm -hmm. issues than, than Barack than, Obama. Than Barack Obama. But, you know, I think people ought to realize that, when, that, that uh, your interests are, doesn't only center on, on governance issues. I mean, you're, you're talking about education, money yeah. for education, money for housing, all of those kinds of um, resources. Yeah, are, and conservation. Are, are, I mean, you know, it, it, right? The the uh, monument. Yeah. So the the the, the last time that Papahānaumo Kuakea was established, um, the Native Hawaiian community, I think it's fair to say, was not consulted, and that was unacceptable. And so, um, as we begun the process around the expansion of the Marine Monument, we basically went back to the Department of Interior and said, you have to have a voice for Native Hawaiians here. And they, for the first time uh, in their history in terms of establishing monuments, put uh, an organization such as OHA, they put OHA as a co-trustee of federal waters. Now you've got a state agency or quasi-state agency being a co-trustee of federal waters, and that was Bob's leadership um, to make sure that Native Hawaiians well, it's actually your leadership, too, Senator. Well, you know. And we are at the point in our discussion where, where, where I get to say all good things must come to an ah. end. And we appreciate very, very much your presence. I know you've taken off time from an important election that you're involved in. And so we appreciate your being here. So, Well, let me, I know we don't have a lot of time, but, but uh, Governor, uh, you have been an incredible leader for Hawaii for a very, very long time. I think it's hard once you're out of office to continue to lead in the right way. And I think anybody who's looking uh, uh, at how they ought to conduct themselves in so-called retirement, they should look at John Y. Hay. <laughs> and they should take up a show like this. Yeah. So thank you all for uh, joining us and um, you know being a part of this exciting conversation with senator brian schatz thank you <laughs>